morning. I can keep my hands off the table. It makes the whole thing right. This is Tex. This is Tex Talks. This is my cup of coffee. I tend to function just a little bit better when I've had some coffee in the morning. Hope you're having a great day. Uh, today I want to talk about well several things, but let's start with the topic of uh, something that I observed when I watched two people. One of them was sitting at the table with me talking, and the person that came up started doing what we call growing up poor mouth. And you go, what is poor mouthing? There's several different ways of looking at poor mouthing. The the actual definition, according to the dictionary folks, is pleading poverty as a defense. When I grew up, poor mouth was basically talking about how bad you had it, either being broke, having no money, things were going bad. Woe is me. Notice that it's starting to sound like the, the victim stance in the drama triangle. And, and I keep coming back. So if you ain't went and looked at the video, you ain't looked it up, you ain't read anything, you need to get on the ball because the drama triangle is a very easy way to understand dynamics between people who are playing a game. And again, I always mention playing the game. Eric Byrne, who wrote Games People Play, transactional analysis was, was way back, I don't know, 60s, 70s. It's, it's a very good way of looking at how people interact and what's going on. And playing the victim can get you things. It can get you sympathy. It can, oh, people go, oh, you poor thing. And it can be a defense against what you didn't do and should be doing. It could also be a way of begging for attention or defending yourself in the sense of people won't ask you for anything if you seem you're bad off. It came about, if I understand the history of it, from people who had wealth when it become uncool to be rich. They would pretend to not have wealth. And so to me, that's a... It's a, I guess it's an inner shame factor going on there. Or to defend it. Again, pretending you don't have something so nobody asks you for anything. Instead of just being able to go, no. But see, here we go back to that games people play and that drama triangle. We're right back into that because if you play the victim, who's going to come and ask you to rescue? See? And that's an avoidance of that. Instead of just being able to have healthy boundaries and go, no. Healthy boundaries is the place to start for so many things. Then you don't have to pretend to be something else. People do invest a lot of time worrying about what other people think of them. And instead of just enjoying life. The thing is, is when you get over-involved in that type of anxiety, it's one thing to be observant and to watch. It's another one to get wrapped up in the drama yourself and lose that valuable thing you have called time. Time that you could have spent enjoying, doing activities you want to do, having fun with life. You get wrapped up in worrying, anticipating, protecting. So again, poor mouthing. And the thing is, is a lot of people do it out of habit, or they do it almost like a contest. And I always make the, the joke, the old farts club, where a bunch of old guys would meet a uh, barbershop, local cafe, pick your spot. And one of them will make a complaint about something in their life. Like, oh, I've got this aching knee, back pain, whatever. And somebody else in the group starts in with, oh, you think that's bad? You know, oh, my lumbago. And, oh, I had to have this surgery. And it becomes a contest over who's got it worst in the group. One that I surely wouldn't want to win, but... People like to play that game. There, there's old traditions where you you have people say that if you, you're not humble and you you show your, your wealth or you show your good fortune, that it's going to call the devil. It's going to call bad luck on you. So many superstitions are involved in this. And I want you to be able to pull that apart in yourself and look. And if you are doing it, go why? Again, back to that self-reflection. Why am I doing that? I will say that the problem with doing it is you call it upon you. You become the self-fulfilling prophet. You become the prophet of doom. You, If you keep talking about how bad things are and that's what you focus on, then you won't notice anything else. Because remember what I said. Your focus is on those things that are in your mind and you've locked in on. So if you've went as far to think your whole world is horrible and bad, whether it is or it isn't, let's put that aside for a minute. If you only notice that, you go back 
again, there's a lot of old things that I'm pulling into this. One of them is that I, I always say people will tend to make a decision and then they will only acknowledge or look for the things that prove it. You decide you want to do something, then everything about you is backing up why you did it. So you feel good about your choice. And you will ignore any evidence contrary to that choice. And any evidence that's even close to being to that choice, you will drag in. So if you think your life is bad and you are committed to proving it so that other people can go, wow, your life really is bad and it's important for you to prove it so everyone knows how bad it is, then every little bad thing in your life will be magnified. You will notice it. You will enhance it. And everything that disproves it disagrees with it, you will ignore. And again, I bring in an old hypnotist trick, which is if you're sitting with a hypnotist, one of the things that can be done while you're trying to change your behavior and you're in a trance is they can have you see the thing that you want or desire or the, the thing you want to do or become and you enhance it. You bring it forward in your mind's eye. You look at it with detail. You enhance the colors. You magnify what you're looking at. You do all these things to make it look bigger, more real. Those things that you want to get away from are distance. You see them going away from you, becoming fuzzy, fuzzy around the edges, losing color, losing that defined shape. And you can do that with sights and sounds and smells. But the idea is, is those things that you enhance, even if it's just in your mind, become more real to you, more noticeable. You don't believe me? Next time you hurt yourself, you stub your toe, something like that, focus on your stub toe and watch that bad boy start to pound with pain. And then the way that when I was a kid, like if you burnt yourself on something, you were taught not to focus on it. They, they try to get you to watch something, do something, have a conversation. If you had a TV, watch the TV, do anything to take your mind off of the pain and it numbs it. Psychologists have learned that. And, and to me, it's one of their more shameful things they've done is they use it in industries like gambling. Sights and sounds will be used in a casino or places like that to enhance an experience or to numb out another one so that you will gamble more, you will do more, you become more excited, more likely to take impulse as a decision-making process instead of rational thought. All these things, again, are about focusing on where you want to go. They've they've made books and movies about it, focusing on what where you want to be. And, and, and I've talked before about the idea that you can, in your mind, think through an action you want to do, like a golf swing or a basketball shot. And the more you practice that in your mind, the more real it becomes. And then when you actually go out to take that golf shot or shoot that basketball, you're better. Because your mind has already done it. Baseball players do it. Football players do it. All kinds of sports will go through and practice. If they can't get to the field, they will practice in their mind doing that thing. Before you go into a big meeting or you go into a job interview, I tell people, think about walking out of that meeting successful, having the job, impressing those people. What's it going to feel like? And you will notice that your body takes on a different position, a posture of success, and you will exude that confidence. It will just come out. Well, it's the same way when you pour mouth. If you go around and, oh, it's so bad. This is a rough year. I'm barely making enough money for ends to meet. I don't know how I'm going to do. I'm barely surviving. As you say, though, that, that's how you are. As you speak, you shape your world. The things that you call forth are the things that are happening to you. And you know what? Even if something good happens, you'll discount it. Oh, well, you know, that just happened. Yeah, that's a fluke. That, that's, you know, I don't really deserve it. Um, the things we will go to, the links to push away a success. And then on the flip side, the smallest little difference. I, I've said you can have 99 successes and one failure. And if you want to, you will focus the heck out of that failure. And that will become your main thing. It's what we do to people that are our friends. They, we could have somebody that we like, that have all kind of good qualities. 
And we will focus on that one quality that we don't like. And then we'll use that to distance ourselves, to think bad of that person, to to break up with somebody. So again, lay off the poor mouthing. If you find yourself doing it in your world, ask yourself, why, why am I doing this? Why is it important that I try to convince that person my life is horrible? Why do they need to know that? And let's just take a minute to delve deeper into that. If that person is only your friend because of how bad you poor mouth yourself, do you really want that kind of friend? Because that kind of friend then is the one that expects you to be that bad? Do you really want friends whose expectation of you is that low or that bad? Or if you're successful, will they be jealous and not want to be your friend? Then that's not your friend. Your friends enjoy your successes. They're happy for you. They're glad that you succeeded. Your friends don't support you in your successes, something's wrong there. If your friends become jealous of you when you do well, something's wrong there. If your friends gather around you and pat you on the back, pats aren't because you succeeded, but the pats are like, yes, we got it bad too. We're all bad. Again, remember, take your three closest people in your life, put them in a blender and pour that in a drink cup. That's you. And if you are hanging out with people who also poor mouth, you might have not picked good friends. You might want to rethink that. If you want to succeed in life and do better, pick friends who support you and help you. If you you have things in your life that are not going well, and there are people that instead of just going, woe is you and pitying you, but actually offer you help, but also demand that you help yourself. See, that's a good friend. Good friends don't do it for you. Good friends support you so that you can do it. And please remember the difference. Okay. It's the same way with therapy. It's the same way with the helping profession. I know that was one of the things about me when I came into the helping profession was as I looked around and all the coworkers and people were helping, but they were doing it for people. And I'm like, why are you doing that? Oh, well, they need such and such. And I'm making all these phone calls for them. And I'm like, you're not teaching them how to survive. You're not doing them no favors. Yeah, when you succeed, you can pat yourself on the back and feel good, but you really didn't help them long term. You just helped yourself feel better. Please know the difference, okay? All right, so that's it in a nutshell. If you're doing it, stop that poor mouthing, start looking for the good, focusing on it, changing your life for the better. You can do it. You deserve a better life. It's waiting for you. Go for it. Y'all have a great day and I'll talk to you later.